and welcome to On the Record, where we talk to um, your favorite musicians about their favorite um, albums by their favorite bands, the ones that really influenced them. Today, Dominic, the album you chose to talk about is Aerosmith's second album from 1974, Get Your Wings. And you know, I just recently purchased this because um, being that this is the uh, 50th anniversary of Aerosmith and their um, recently announced the Farewell Tour, they've been re-releasing uh, re a lot of uh, um, mm -hmm. classic albums. And um, this is one they uh, they did. And um, it's nothing really special, but I, I like that they a lot of the coloring is kind of a little brighter and stuff. And you get a nice little booklet in here. So people should check this out. Um, now, let's share with us, um, why did you pick this album? You picked a couple that you want to talk about, but... What is it about Aerosmith? Um, that, you know, tell us how they came on your radar, if you will. So my father was a big Aerosmith fan. So I can remember being, you know, four or five years old. My dad was pumping, you know, Aerosmith's greatest hits, you know, Walk This Way and Dream On and Sweet Emotion, all that. So I really, like, really got into them um, at a young age. And by the time I was maybe 11 or 12, that was like my favorite band. You know, I had every record. I had bootlegs. I had everything. And that record just always kind of stood out to me because um, if you look at like other stuff that came out in 74, yeah. it really didn't sound like anything else that was out there. You know, yeah. um, it, it was almost like a proto punk record. You know, like if you listen to like their version of Train, the live part of Train Kept a Rolling and, and stuff like that, like it was very intense and like very driving where a lot of people were still in that the back end of that 70s, you know, flower movement, you know, where there's a lot of psychedelic stuff still going on these long improvised jams and everything so it was like really quick and concise you know three minute songs that just came out just like smash in the face you know and then they would turn it around and do you know like one of the most beautiful acoustic ballads ever you know seasons of wither which is just probably my all-time favorite song you know yeah yeah how could it not be i mean that's one of my all-time favorite aerosmith songs period and you know um it's interesting because if you go back and you listen to the very first aerosmith album um it's a little more gritty a little more um yeah, even I dare say it, it's a little closer to metal than even hard rock or um, mm -hmm. it's a little heavier. And um, I think that's where they're kind of, you know, experimenting. They're trying to find their sound. And what was interesting in doing my um, research for today's show is come to find out that this album, Get Your Wings, it was really a make it or break it album because for the simple mm -hmm. fact that the, um, in spite of having a great song like Seasons of Winter and stuff like Mama Can, um, the first album really didn't have it very much fanfare. I was reading they... Um, it didn't get any promotion. It wasn't getting any kind of radio airplay. There were no kind of um, ads. The band, um, for whatever reason, I don't know if the record company didn't set up any interviews, but they didn't do any PR. And so it, um, just for a simple fact that it got such, um, you know, uh, didn't get a great response at the time. And so they went yeah. back to the studio to, to write the songs for Get Your Wings. And they're like, okay, we got to really um, step up our game a little. And um, mm -hmm. and I think, um, you know, I, I love a debut album, but I think this is just kind of... Um, like I said, that make it or break it album, and they really stepped it up here. Yeah. So, so the funny story is with the first record is that uh, Aerosmith's first record came out on the same day as Bruce Springsteen's first record, okay. and Columbia was all in on uh, Bruce Springsteen. They put all their marketing money behind him, so there was nothing left for Aerosmith. Yeah. You know. Um, but yeah, like you know, the 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 whole process of of the Get You Wings recording is incredible. I mean, they're at the, they're at the record plant in New York City. Um, they basically living in the studio at that point, you know, because they there was no money for them, sure. and they're writing everything on the fly. I mean, like it, it was they were locked in a room for eighteen hours a day and just writing and jamming and getting things good, and and it's just a very raw and very gritty album. But you can also hear like what's yet to come. Like the the song structure was really starting to to, to meld right. Uh, that's the album where Joe Perry started becoming the lead guitar player. I mean. The first album's great, but most of the lead guitar playing is Brad Whitford. And, yeah. uh, on get, you know, Get Your Wings, that's when Joe Perry really starts stepping up because th they realize that he can also write. You know, he, sure. you know, same old song and dance is one of the best riffs ever written, in my opinion, you know? So, I mean, it, it they really sort of gelling together, and it, it's just, fan I mean, there, there's, even the songs that are not like, like, Woman of the World is probably my least favorite song on that record, and that's still a great song. You know, I, I, everything just, just, just sounds incredible on that record. It's funny you say that because, um, who hasn't heard all those great Aerosmith songs at, off this album? Now, there's a couple of them, like you, you mentioned, um, um, Woman of the Year, I think, or something like that. Woman of the World, yeah. Woman of the World, um, Spaced, and, and Pandora's yes. Box. Those did not get a lot of heavy um, airplay. And everything else on the, off this album, you know, everybody's heard. And so, again, when I recently purchased this album, I'm hearing these songs kind of like for the first time. I've never heard them before. 
and right. it's kind of like hearing a new song and and it, it's interesting and and you could kind of see why those other songs maybe stand out a little more but they're equally as good as songs i mean you can see that like i said um they're kind of developing their songwriting at that point you know this is kind of just what came out yeah i mean uh so like space was a, was a song that steven tower wrote when he was with the strangers back in like 68 or 69 he just had that in his back pocket you know and and uh, Pandora's Boxes, Joey Kramer wrote that guitar riff. You know, I mean, like everybody contributed on that record in some way. And uh, I think I really like, like, Stephen Tower became a singer on that record. Like, if you listen to the first one, the vocals are always been there. He's always had an amazing voice, but it was a lot more rhythmic talking on the first album. And then on this album, he was really singing, and you can just hear that that grit in his voice. You know, as a vocalist, right. myself. he was really developing it, um, his singing voice for the simple fact. A lot of people may not realize this, but um, I read that before Steven Tyler was ever a singer, he started out as a drummer. Drummer, like, yep. Like you know, Phil Collins, Janie Lane, and many other people to follow. Yeah. You know, um, and, and me. <laughs> And so it's it's amazing that he's got the because he, now all these years later he's considered a legendary singer. He's like one of the um, you know people point people point to you know that that guy. I want to be like him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've I've been lucky enough. I've never met any of the members of of Aerosmith, but I've met people that worked with them in the heyday. Yeah. And uh, I met Night Bob Jazowski, who was their sound guy for years. And uh, he said that Steven Towers is as good as drummer as anybody else out there. He said, like, you put him behind the drums and he's incredible. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's yeah. one of those guys that could do anything. And then you look at you look at a song like Lord of the Thighs. Um, mm, yeah. I don't even really know what the song's about. I, I kind of use my imagination, but just that title, it gets me. Like, uh, I remember before I even heard the song, just, uh, wow, I got to hear what this is all about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a song about the the, the pimps and the prostitutes in, in the Bowery. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like like I said, you got that dirt, you got that grit, and Stephen Tower knew how to write about it and how to bring it to life and everything. That's I used to cover that song with my my band Wicked Garden. We we covered that a few times. It's just a fun song, and it's it's got this groove to it that you can do it in any kind of genre. You know, it's I mean, it, well, I'm sorry. I'm gonna say I've been an Aerosmith fan, you know, all my life too. And another thing, and I'm um, doing the research for today's show, but I never knew the song SOS Too Bad. Any idea what SOS stands for? Same old shit. Same old shit. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I never know that, but I'm like, wow. Yeah. 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 Another one of my favorites. Another, I, uh, again, like a groove that is just like insane. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a very put together song. If you listen to it, you know, it's not musically challenging in the fact that, oh my God, it's impossible to play. But there's a groove to that song that if you don't hit it right, it just, it's just not the same. Like they were really locked in on that, on that song. Yeah, I mean, that, right? a, a song like that, you know, same old song and dance. Um, Aerosmith is described all the time as like kind of hard rock blues and that's exactly what they are but like on some of this stuff like SOS Too Bad, Same Old Song and Dance, it's a little more gritty or a little more raw like a lot of bands you know when they're putting out their first couple albums they're real, still young and hungry and you can yeah. you can kind of feel that on this album. Yeah I mean yeah like a lot of people say you know they're, they're the American version of the Stones which I kind of agree with but they also were more the American version of Led Zeppelin too. You know, they had that bluesy bass background. They had that, you know, that 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 heaviness to them. You know, yeah. like I'll put up, you know, a lot of some of the the deeper tracks that came later, like of uh, like of Toys of the Attic. Um, you know, uh, uh, I can't even think of the name of the song now. Oh, Round and Round. That is heavier than anything Zeppelin ever did, and that was in nineteen seventy five. You know, it's yeah. like so yeah. they really yeah. melted both of those together. In fact, as I was telling you, um, they recently re released a lot of the um older albums and stuff like um, Night in the Ruts that is, hasn't been available for years. And I yeah. got that just because I wanted to hear it. And that is really a different sounding Aerosmith. That's kind of, it's features some of Brad Wilford, but that's after him and Joe left the band. They got mm. Jimmy Crispo and this other guy, Ricky Faith. And I tell you, that is really, you got to listen to that if you never had, that's really like Aerosmith heavy metal style. It just yeah. sounds like, it's good. It, it just sounds very different if people... Wouldn't expect a, an album like that from Aerosmith, which is probably why it didn't sell as well. But it's not bad. It's, but it's it's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. You know, they, they were. It's funny because you got to think Aerosmith's heyday was 76, 77, 78. You know, by seventy nine, disco had pretty much killed everything, including rock bands. I mean, the Stones were putting out "Miss You," Kiss was putting out "I Was Made for Loving You." I mean, yeah. and they were still like, "No, we're just going to get heavier." Yeah, you know, like they, everybody's doing disco now. We're just going to do harder rock and. 
Yeah, it's a, it's an you know, Night in the Rough is an underrated record. It's actually very good. Even the one they did without Joe Perry and Brad Woodford next, uh, Rock in a Hard Place, yeah. is a fantastic record, and it's heavy as hell. Yeah, you know, like I said they they never kind of wavered from that, uh, that 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 heaviness that they had brought up with. He's like, no, this kept getting heavier on every single album, which you know it, it made them fall out of favor for a little while because everybody yeah. was into disco and stuff. But it it definitely worked. Oh sure, sure, and, and um, I think with those um, two albums, you know, Nights and Rust and Rock in a Hard Place, um, people think, okay, well they still they still had Steven Tyler, you know, running the band, but it, it showed you um, all those those are two great albums. They didn't have that classic Aerosmith sound that everybody yeah. loved, and and it really showed that even though you still have the singer, you know, kind of the heart and soul of the band, you know, especially Joe Perry, you know, Joe Perry and um, Stephen are kind of they, they that kind of fusion, that kind of forms mm -hmm. of all this great Aerosmith stuff. And yeah, they're the Dodge the Twins. Joe <laughs> Perry, it's not the same, you know. It's really not, and and I think I think Joe Perry and Brad Whitford are probably the, the greatest guitar duo ever. I mean, they play off each other so well, and if you really want to experience that uh on an album um this one definitely but also believe it or not honking on bobo which was their blues covers album yeah, I remember the that, guitar yeah. work on that is unbelievable and how they play off of each other so well i mean it's it's rare to get one guitar player in a band that can be that good to get two of them it's unheard of yeah and i, I forget who did the original version but it, um talking a little bit about toys on the attic the song i really loved off of that um mm -hmm. big 10 inch record i mean that's a that's a cover of some other blues artists but Tiny man, Bradshaw. They really, they really rocked that up, and man, they made it Aerosmith. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I and mean, it, it's it 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 mean it's it's right in their wheelhouse. It's funky. It's got that ragtime feel to it, and then it's it's dirty. It's got innuendo. It's you know right up Stephen Towers' alley, right there. You can see why in the '80s they they got together with Run DMC and they did a new version of Walk This Way. Because if you think about it, um, I don't know if people realize this. Um, Walk This Way to me was really probably one of the first really kind of. Um, songs that had rap elements to it you know but they were like a rock song and um if you, if you listen to the version of run dmc that's a little more of a rap version but you could see that um that was kind of the start start of rap you know yeah absolutely uh, steven tower is an amazing vocalist like not just his, his you know the power in his voice but he has a great sense of melody and rhythmic timing you know, back so love always how I need the cut i mean just hitting every first yeah second, i seen right like on an interview where he does this thing called um rhyme scheming like when he's trying to write a song he just throws out a bunch of words until he finds some words that i mean he just creates yeah. that way it's, it's great it's it's unbelievable like how how to do that and do it consistently you know for 50 yeah. years just to never lose a step on it yeah, it's, yeah it's that amazing. is your true gift as you say because you know you hear so many times people and i don't know if you've experienced it yourself like trying to sit down and write a song and oh, i got writer's block and i'll come back to it um mm -hmm. yeah i do it all the time uh, what i do is i like to if I don't have the lyrics written completely, I'll just do things phonetically until something fits. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll I'll sing, you know, about grape juice if it fits, you know, and then I go, then okay, now I can kind of sub out what I really want to say. But yeah, that's that's an yeah. old trick. And then I, I don't know if you know, but on, on the the new Tesla Live album, they do a great cover of um, SOS Too Bad. Oh no, I did not hear that. Now I got to see that. Now I got to download that. <laughs> that's pretty cool. But see, when a band like that covers. Uh, classic song like that i think that's pretty cool because it, it shows you that um it's a song that people are still thinking about all these years later yeah absolutely i mean there was a there was a tribute album to Aerosmith that came out maybe 15 20 years ago and i gotta admit that it was pretty god awful and, and which surprised me because there was so many great musicians involved in it like dio was involved in it and tesla tesla did probably one of the best versions of uh, i want i think they did no more no more uh but one of their versions but everything else in it that was so it's bad. Song. I don't know why it wasn't a bigger um, <laughs> song. And then, you know, but, again, talking a little bit about Sweet, um, I love always love the song Sweet Emotion. And um, again, I don't, um, that's a, that's, I don't know if people realize what it's even about, but it's kind of talking about a guy getting a thrill, you know, from a girl. And um, I love the way he's able to kind of, with his lyrics, kind of, um, there's a hidden meaning, if you know what I mean. People got to go read it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's great. He actually, that song was actually written about Joe Perry's wife. It's not a very nice song either. <laughs> it's very caustic, you know. But again, that's 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 the greatness of Steven Tyler was, was to throw innuendo in there and make you think about something, yeah, you know, or think it's about something else. And, yeah. and you know, what's interesting in doing the research for today's show, again, this was a make it or break it album, and and you can see the difference a producer makes. I understand it was on this album that they really um first 
started working with Jack D Douglas and kind of really developed that uh, relationship that they would go. Interestingly enough, a record company originally wanted Bob Ezrin to produce it, but yeah. I guess for whatever reason, he didn't take too much of an interest in it. So Jack Douglas was actually an engineer that was working under Bob Ezrin. And he said, why don't you take over the project? Yeah. And it, it, it was it was like the perfect storm. You know, Jack Douglas had a very good ear for what they were trying to do. Uh, what I always love is uh, if you listen to a lot of the guitar tracks were recorded with the amplifiers outside in the hallway. Okay. And then he mic the hallway to get that reverb sound that they have on there. Because reverb wasn't really that big of a deal back then. Like, you didn't hear a lot of it, you know? And if you did hear it, it was built into the amp and it just sounded terrible. Um, so there's a lot of studio tricks. And then, of course, you know, everybody knows that it's not Joe Perry and and Brad Woodford playing on train on the live part of Train Kept a Rolling. It's actually Dick Wagner uh, from the Alice Cooper band. And um, Steve also. And so, yeah. And, you know, so a lot of people know, you know, now, like, it's like the worst kept secret in rock. It's like, yeah. but... You know, that's what a good producer does. A good producer says, I'm not getting what I need out of you guys. I'm going to bring somebody else that can do it. You know, and it's it happens more often than people think. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. In fact, that's I, I think Bob Ezrin might have even had something to do with that because, because, again, he was the one they originally wanted to work with. For whatever reason, it didn't work out. And he had done all those great Alice Cooper albums. And I, I know on some of the, like on Kiss Destroyer, I think, on the song Sweet Pain, Ace mm -hmm. Brayley didn't show up to do the um, solo. So he called in... Um, Dick Wagner of all people from Alice yeah. Superman to, to cut the solo. And that, that's just what was done back in the day. Like a certain person didn't show up, they couldn't show up, they were sick or whatever. They mm -hmm. get in another studio musician. Yeah. I, like I said, it happens more often than people think. Yeah. That's why like, I always found um I I'm a big monkeys fan, even. And like people say, Oh, the monkeys didn't play in their albums. Okay, first of all, the monkeys did, but second of all, you think anybody played on their records back then? Like it was all studio musicians 90% of the time. You know, even to this day, I mean, I, you know, on my record, you know, I had, you know, my producer, Jason, play lead guitar in a couple of songs just because I couldn't do what I want, you know, what yeah. this song needed. I couldn't do it, but he could. So let him do it. You know, there's nothing yeah, wrong with it's that. Especially about the monkeys. And, um, you know, all these years later, we come to find out that um, it was basically a TV show and they had other writers come in and write the song. And apparently two, two of the guys in the band were actual musicians. But yeah. what I loved about the monkeys is it became kind of a real band because the guys that weren't really true musicians they learned how to play their instruments and they they kind of became a band because of a tv show yeah absolutely i've, I've always said you know uh every country rock band from the eagles to wilco should give mike nesmith royalties every single time they step on stage because the guy invented country rock yeah you yeah. know and i mean if you listen to the stuff you do with the first national band and stuff like that i mean he invented the genre you know it's very underrated i mean you know we lost him a couple of years ago but i, I sure. lost him, but went to see him he didn't play the first time I saw them, but when I finally saw them about six years ago, I got to see Papa Nez. It was one of the greatest nights of our There's only one more uh, living monkey. They've all passed on. Sadly. Yeah. But, you it's know, sad, to yeah. me, that's true entertainment that um, for years people had no idea that, you know, some of the guys didn't play. Um, but like I said, I love the fact they became a band. And the fact is, if through a TV show, you know, these records were made of these songs, it, at the end of the day, it's pure entertainment. If people, people were liking it, so what, you know? Yeah, exactly. If people worry too much about stuff that they have no control over. Just enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, and, and yeah, so um, I think really um, this was the start of, you know, Aerosmith. Um, from this album on, they just, they, they went up and, you know, eventually, you know, the drugs kind of um, kind of got in the way and that's kind of what led to the, Joe and Brad leaving. And, and then they, they get back together in the 80s. So I'm sure like a lot of us, you're a huge fan of the 70s era but what did you think yeah. when they got back together in the 80s so i mean i was i loved it at the time i mean i i think you know uh the the first comeback album which was done with mirrors was very choppy but it wasn't bad um front of vacation was great pump was fantastic uh from start to finish uh you know get a grip i thought was really good and then like afterwards it started kind of getting it, you know it was form formulatic already it's getting yeah, extremely yeah. formulatic once they hit like just push play and nine lives. I was kind of like, okay, I, I haven't heard anything new. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, they were using song doctors. They had been using them for years, but now they're just relying more on them. Joe Perry and Steven Tyler were not getting along for most of that time. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have that camaraderie of like, you know, sitting in a room together and working on a song. Like they didn't even talk to each other for years. Yeah, you know? yeah. so, and that kind of came through, but yeah, I mean, everything from 1973 to 1980 is just fantastic. Like there's, there's not a, there's not a bad, album or record or song even the b-sides are incredible and the stuff they didn't release you know was was great 
Yeah, and I'll tell you, like, uh, um, what was really nice is they recently put out another Greatest Hits collection. If anybody's a fan, I suggest you get the deluxe version. It's like, mm -hmm. instead of getting um, one, a one-disc CD, you get three three disc CD. I, I pay like thirty five dollars through Amazon, but uh -huh. it was worth it because I mean, if you're a fan and you like that, you got all your favorite songs. I mean, there's really nothing that was, that I didn't like on the three CD collection. But you know, that's just mm -hmm. me because again, I'm a collector. I'm old school guy. I love to have something in my hand like this. You know, it, right? It's, you know, look looking at the beautiful artwork. I mean, um, I talked to people today. Oh, I just I, I don't even buy albums. I just buy whatever the latest single is for ninety nine cents. Um, and as you know, as an artist, you're lucky if people go on your site and eat, or even you know YouTube and play the song all the way through. Yeah, no, I, I trust me, I get it. I, I I've been lucky enough with this record that I put out last year. Like we we sold a decent amount of physical copies, which is great. It streams very well too. But yeah, I mean, like it's definitely you know uh, it's the bane of everybody's existence right now the streaming thing you need it there's nothing you can do about it so you just got to deal with it the fact that you make no money off of it sucks but at least people are listening and it's you know it's easy to track these days you know like i can log onto my computer here and find out who's been listening for the last 28 days and yeah. you know it's consistently 40 something countries so that's great not seeing any money but it's still awesome you know? yeah yeah, yeah. That, that, that's cool that's gotta be a great feeling to, um to realize that 47 countries around the world are checking out your latest album. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Like, and sometimes it's like, you know, it's countries I, I'm like, they have, you know, they have music in that country. I never even heard of it before. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that countries where you haven't even stepped foot in. I mean, that's, that's gotta be the ultimate. Cause like, wow. Somebody oh yeah. Like, you know, I got streams in Estonia. I'm like, I didn't even know Estonia was real. I thought that was like a movie. <laughs> <you know>? like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are you working on now, Dominic? So, uh, you know, as I, last year, as I, as I shamelessly promote, because I like to hold things too, this is Candy at a Funeral. This is my record that came out last year. Uh, it did sell very well, so that Tone House Records went ahead and relighted the second record, so I'm in the middle of uh, recording that right now. Um, I don't have a name for it yet. I've got a few that I'm thinking of, but it's going to be another five or possibly six song EP. Okay. Um, we're hoping to get it out probably late winter, early spring of 2024. Yeah. Um, I have a, a band uh that's backing me up called chemical tribes we've been doing live shows uh, around the vegas area and gonna start kind of branching out from there as well so you know gonna put out another one and see how it goes yeah, when and, you uh, play out when you play out live like how long are your shows usually like uh, 45 minutes or what like yeah like lately it's, a lot of them been, because i'm doing almost all original materials 45 minutes to an hour tops um you know when i was with wicked garden because we started off as a cover band we would do four hour gigs and i i'm too old like i'm sorry <laughs> like you know it's fun but i can't do that anymore so we usually do about an hour and we'll do you know almost all of this uh ep a lot of stuff from the new the new album then i throw in a couple of weird ass covers just because i'm a jerk sometimes you know <laughs> i like to keep people on their toes <laughs> and, and do you do you ever include any wicked garden stuff did you say no and it's funny you say that because i actually asked people on my uh Bye social media pages what they thought of the idea because i do get messages from people saying hey are you ever going to do any wicked garden stuff i really wanted to kind of keep it separate yeah. because i just in my eyes wicked garden was always going to be my priority I but sure. now that wicked, wicked garden is pretty much on indefinite hiatus i don't think it's ever going to come back if it does it's still going to be a while yeah it's like well i wrote those songs so i should be able to play them i'm just yeah yeah that's why i was asking and you know maybe yeah. what you could do is if you still want to keep it kind of separate maybe like on an anniversary or something of the album you know to possibly yeah. i might do that the funny thing is that my drummer for chemical tribe ron huddy who's been amazing is, is stepping down because he's just really busy with his other projects huh. and the wicked garden drummer jay dardano is most likely going to join up oh. so now you got two of us in the band like okay we'll probably we'll probably pull one or two of them out every now and then Oh wow, wow, that's fun. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, and just to kind of wrap this up today, I, um, mm -hmm. talking about Steve, Steve seasons of winter, I was reading what he wrote it about was mm -hmm. um, looking out his window one day, like at the Massachusetts landscape. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, just middle of February, I think he said it was, and uh, it was it was snowy, and he was in a place that had no heat, and he found this messed up acoustic in a dumpster, and he had to tune it really weird, like. It's just it's the perfect recipe for a great song. Yeah, like sure, you can't sure. force that. It just kind of happens. That that's why, yeah, that's why I think it's such a beautiful song, you know. Oh um, yeah. That acoustic riff is how I buy acoustic guitars. When I go into like a guitar center or Sam Ash, 
If there's an acoustic guitar I like, I pick it up and I play that song. If it sounds good, I buy it. If it doesn't do that song justice, nope. I won't touch it. So every, yeah, the, yeah. Yes, the eight that. or nine acoustic guitars have all had that song on there right now. <laughs> I haven't seen it on YouTube. John John Karabi does that song at some of his solos, oh, yeah. and he does a great um, does a great version of that. And um, he does, yeah, yeah. So so that's uh, and it's funny because not that it's not a great song, but for whatever reason, Dream Love uh, was kind of a bigger hit and gets a little more mm -hmm. love. But I anybody I know that's heard season of winter I said yeah man that that's that song is where it's at, you know yeah it's it's just miles ahead of everything I, I the first time I ever saw them do it live was in 1992 I believe it was and they had pulled it out and I just well, I went nuts I was just screaming I was at Madison Square Garden in New York and it was just unbelievable they just came out and they I heard the open riff I was like no friggin' way because they hadn't done it since like the late 70s and it just Oh, it's fantastic. That's a beautiful song. And again, I, for whatever reason, you know, Dream Love gets, Dream On gets all the love. But I do think sometimes the fans know a little more than the record company, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, they 90% of the time. I've always said record companies are guys that step in shit and then show you the bottom of the shoe and go, look what I found. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing because you go to any concert and oftentimes, you know, like an Aerosmith concert, and you will see songs like that that are not necessarily a huge hit. But the fans, like, in, at the concert, they just respond to it for whatever reason. Yeah. Well, it's because it's more personal to them. It ha you don't have to share it with 50 million other people. You know, yeah. it's it's like, that. that's why people like to brag you know, when they see a band that that exploded and got really popular. I used to see them when they were clubs because back then they were theirs. Now you got to share them with everybody, and that's the whole thing, you know? Yeah, and you know, Dominic, we're all getting older, but, like, um, it's hard to sit here and believe that um, Aerosmith has been doing this for 50 years, and um, it's even harder to believe that Steven Tyler is, like, you know, in his mid seventies, and, right. and I mean, he looks, he looks, you know, he looks his age, but he doesn't really, if you know what I mean. He looks kind of, he, he looks like he's lived the life, I guess. But uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's hard to believe he's he's that old. And um, what do you think of Aerosmith wrapping up? I mean, I guess they really have nothing left to prove. They really don't. And I, 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 you know, I kind of think it's time. And I think that I wish more bands would kind of bow out gracefully than stay around for one tour too many. Um, I think they they you know they've proved everything they needed to prove. Hopefully, they've made all the money they need to make. Sure, I mean, yeah. You know? <laughs> and I know a lot of you know a lot of bands they go on tour just because they have to. Like you know, it's like always, my my joke about the Who has always been you know Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey hate each other, but man, they really love money. You yeah. know, so <laughs> well, well, I think well, it's what's, glad they're doing what's it. funny about the Who. I, I I read recently an article where Roger Daltrey was complaining about um, like a lot of bands how much um, how much it costs to even take the who on the road and he was talking about it we're pretty much wrapping the who up but but if we ever pl play out live we'll probably just do shows around europe and around england where we where we're from because um it just costs too much to take it on the road i'm thinking even a band like the who see <laughs> oh yeah absolutely i mean it's the, the costs are insane in america especially but it, all of the world it's it's insane and it's like and because that you don't have the, the revenue of of selling records and stuff like that that's the only way you can make money but the outlier is so high that the profit margins really slim and it just doesn't make sense anymore and i, I agree with you. you know um i often complain about bands that kind of um well we're just going to go you know hit the road we're not putting out any new music but i think aerosmith was one of the few bands where maybe it made sense because like you said they got to a point where um it just you know it was a little different than their classic sound and I think they reached that point where um, when they go on the road now, they know the songs the fans want to hear. Exactly. Exactly. People, they, they're going to play, the, you know, the, all the hits from the 70s and 80s and a few of the 90s. And that's it. There's no, like, you know, even the Stones have done it for the last one. I think it's like 12, 13 years they put out a record. They realize it's like, you know, it's 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 a legacy now. You go out, you do the songs that wants to hear, and then you go home. I mean, you know, even the Stones, I mean, I, I think they're the one exception of the rule as far as, um, I think those guys are literally going to die Mick Jagger is like 80 years old and he's still out there doing it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, if you think about it, like Mick Jagger's been doing it since he was 19. So this guy's been, he's been doing it 70 years now, almost 60 yeah. years, whatever it is. Yeah. That's what else is he going to do? Yeah. That's one from the record books. Yeah. Well, right. well Dominic, I, I enjoyed uh, talking again. And so this will be going up probably about a week. I'll be sure to let you know. Feel yeah, free to sure. share it. And um, yeah, and we'll, we'll definitely do this again. So um, take care, my friend. You too, man. Thank you. Just give me a call when you're ready. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. See you. Okay, let's see.